I am so happy about this conversation today. It is such an honor and a privilege to talk to someone that I admire greatly and I admire both of her parents and what a great way to kick off our Black Love, Black History celebration than having a conversation with Ilyasa Shabazz. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining The Color Conversation. Thank you, Steph Stephanie. And you know, it is an honor to uh, sit here and talk to you. I come to um, the Martha's Vineyard African American oh. Film Festival every year. And, you know, I've always just admired you tremendously. And, and when we met, you know, a few years ago, I tell you, it was just the highlight of our trip. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. And, you know, and it's true, you have been coming for a long time, but we've never really had a chance to connect and talk because I'm so busy and you're running around that when you came last year with Netflix with that great documentary and I'm like, you know what? I am taking the time to get to know this brilliant woman because I think you're amazing. And I think carrying on your parents' legacy is such a, a beautiful thing. So thank you for your support of coming to the film festival. And thank you for, for everything that you're doing to uh, you know uplift our race and our people and keep your parents' legacy alive. Thank you. You know, um, it just seemed that every time I watched programs years ago, and I saw my father just slowly being pushed out of history. Um, you know, I just thought about all the work my mother was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, you know, something that I had, I was so determined to do, not so that my father could be famous, but for the benefit of future generations. Wow. Yes. Yep. You were just shy of three years old when your father Malcolm X was killed. What are some of your earliest memories of him? Well, um, you know, it's funny. My mother spoke about her husband, about daddy, for as long as I can remember. And I can say that I have flickering images of him. Wow. But I'm so grateful to my mother that the stories that she continually shared made sure, uh, she was making sure that we grew up knowing our father and um and and she wanted to make sure that we understood that our father didn't leave us um but she kept him a part of our household and and so we knew that our father loved us um we knew that our father you know would be proud when we did something great in school you know she she hung our art uh in the vestibule uh, when you first walked into our home along with um, some photographs of our father. So, you know, I remember a beautiful rocking chair. It was a blue and white rocking chair that I had. And I had this memory of having cookies with my father when he would come home. But I didn't know if it was that I really remembered the story or was it because she continually shared the story, how I would come, I would wait for my father. We'd have these cookies that she'd make. And I'd go with him in the den to eat these cookies. And when he was killed, that I would go still looking for my father and she would put a cookie, you know, on a plate and break it. And that I would take these cookies with me to bed. And so when she told the story at one of the National uh, Congress of Negro Women with C. Dolores Tucker, Merle Evers, Coretta Scott King, you know, all these great women, um, my girlfriend who was there with me, you know, they looked at me like, that's why you have this affinity for cookies, <laughs> you know, this addiction for cookies. And I'm telling you, I try so hard to just kick that habit. Oh. But at least she let me know why I had. And, and, you know, my youngest sisters, the twins who weren't even born, they even could tell stories about their father. And, you know, in retrospect, I think, wow, you know, you would never know that they never laid eyes on him because, wow. you know, my mother was pregnant when he was assassinated in front of her and, and her babies. Mm. So how, tell me, how did your parents meet? Do you know that story? I do. Oh, great. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's a popular story because I think they even have it in the movie. They do in Malcolm X, yes. Right, mm -hmm. right. And my mother wrote this great article back in the day in Essence Magazine when Susan Taylor was there. Right. and. Um, someone introduced them. They thought that she would be great 
for him because she was beautiful. She was yes. brown, apple brown, yeah. Betty. Yeah. Beautiful. And she was very smart, you know, grad had was graduating, or I think she had already graduated from college. Wow. And she, and she was getting her master's degree. Mm-hmm. And so um she was teaching at the mosque health and hygiene for women. And they kept, you know, bringing them together. Right. And father took her to the museum and the rest was history. Beautiful. And we're so glad that they were, they were together. What does it mean to you that your parents considered by many, many people are iconic historic figures? What does that mean to you? And is that a heavy weight to carry? You know, I can't, I can say, I am absolutely so proud of my parents. Of you know, when my mother passed away, I took a step back and I looked at her life from the perspective of a woman, right? Not from the perspective of being her daughter. And I said, my gosh, you know, she inspired me. I was, I feel so fortunate to have had her as my role model, as my mentor, as my best friend. Um, she was someone that, you know, you could trust 199999999 percent. Um, she was brilliant, smart, compassionate, loving. Um, she was just amazing. She was raised in the African Methodist Episcopalian Church. And uh, it was a famous church in Detroit with a lot of activist women. Um, they were deltas. They were housewives from the Housewives League. Her, the woman who, who raised her was uh, the, the um, Sunday school teacher. Her husband was the deacon of the church. And, um, you know, when I wrote Betty Before X, I said, wow, this is why they were together because they both had the same foundation. You know, their parents, my father's father was a minister also. Um, president of the um, Industrial League, also chapter president of the Garvey movement, also served on the PTA, you know, really active. His mother was um, the recording secretary of this organization that commanded millions of followers in in the 1920s. And so they both were reared, you know, with this spiritual base, this spiritual foundation you know, the oneness of God, understanding the oneness of man, the oneness of woman. And, um, you know, I was just really happy that they found their way together. And it has never, well, when I went to college, it was a bit of a, um, you know, I was overwhelmed with expectations, you know, who they thought Malcolm was, right, was inaccurate, Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And they thought that I should be this person who they thought their hero was. And wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, my father was love, peace, joy, and that was who I was. Right. Wow. That's yeah, that, that would be a lot to to have to weigh. I want to pivot a little bit and talk about black love. So when we talk about black love and, you know, what that means for people, what does it mean to you? And what do you think it means in the context of your parents' relationship? Um, When I think of Black love, I think, you know, that first we have to have self-love. Oh, there you go. Very good. And I'm grateful that my parents made sure we had that. Mm. You know, my mother made sure that all six of her girls learned about the significant contributions that women made to the world the significant contributions that Islam made to the world and the significant contributions that the African diaspora, you know, made to the world. We learned about the continent as a first world nation, not as a third world nation. And we understood that it was the cradle of civilization. We learned about, you know, the kingdoms of, of, of Benin, of Nigeria, you know, just the Congo, Egypt. And so I think that Black love, you know, is first loving who you are so that you can see others as a reflection of you, you know, and and I'm grateful for that. Because to me, Black love is just beautiful. You know, Black love is just 
everything. You know, <laughs> it's black. It's great music. That's right. Like, it is um, Sunday. Fashion, it's everything. <laughs> everything. Dinner, everything. Everything. I love that. That's a great answer. I love it. I love it. So when I say, what, what names of women come to mind when I say the words fearless, strong, and leader? Fearless, strong, and leader. You know, I think about the women who were in our my households growing up, mm. like Miriam Makiba, um, um, Maya Angelou. Wow. Um, my mother, of course, C. Dolores Tucker. You know, just so many. Even um, Mac Maxine Waters. Wow. You know, so many dynamic women. And I'm again so grateful. Wow, I, I I agree with everything you said. That's fantastic. I understand that you were close to Coretta Scott King, and Mrs. Yes. Avery's. What impact did these powerful women have on you? Ooh, well, especially when my mother passed away. Aunt, uh -huh. You know, we called her Aunt Coretta. Uh -huh. She was just amazing because mm -hmm. I think what we began to discover was that everyone wasn't like our mother, that everyone wasn't giving, everyone wasn't kind, everyone, you know, um, you know, we, you know, when you think about unconditional love, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so that is how um, Aunt Coretta came to fill that void for us. You know, she was just so amazing and, 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 um, you know, she would always send cards. She would always call you on the phone, you know, just really amazing. When my first book came out, she, you know, ordered boxes and boxes oh. of books. <laughs> you know, nice. she's just amazing. Right, right. Oh, that's great. Now, would you consider yourself an activist? And, and if so, what does that mean to you? Because, you know, activism takes so many different shapes and forms. What does it mean to you? Um, well, you know, I think that when you understand that life is about it giving back, right? It's about leaving a predicament better than you found it. That's right. You know, when you see others who um, can't stand up, who can't speak, that you lend yourself. And I think that's you know, being responsible and accountable for your life. Um, and so the word activist and, and activism, um, I think is just a way of life. That's interesting. And do you think of yourself as an activist? I do, I do. Um, you know, I know that I was an activist all my life. Now that mm -hmm. I'm getting older, you know, I'm not out there in the forefront, but there's work that I do. There's you know, the books that I've written. There's the programming that we do at the Shabbat Center. There's right. the lectures, you know, that I do here in this country and abroad. Right. Um, so if if we're going to say, um, you know, define what activism is, you know, being accountable, being responsible, right. being vocal and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. Fantastic. And I read somewhere that your father felt that he was the defender of the disenfranchised. Can you talk about what that means to you as his daughter and how your work extends that title? <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> um, you know, my father provided the biggest critique of America and all he did was he held a mirror up and he insisted that America live up to its promise of liberty and justice for all of its citizens, period. And we're and, still and, there, which is insane. We're still holding this mirror up. Right, that's right. Absolutely insane. That's and right. You, you recently say that your father has been quoted in social media, social media posts 53,700 times per hour per day. So it's really clear, it, it's clear evidence that he still has such an impact on young people, right? Absolutely. On social media. And his influence is just, is still felt. 
And I wonder if he ever thought of himself as, I wonder if he even thought that we would still be, you know, talking about him to the extent that we talk about him all the time. And, you know, when I look on social, there's always a picture of your dad. I go to the store. There's always a picture of his face. Like, it's just, I find it amazing. And I love the fact that this country is realizing the important impact that your father had and that he was not the way that government tried to portray him. He, he was not that man, you know, and I'm just astounded that 53,700 times per day, per hour, someone is quoting Malcolm X, putting Malcolm X's big picture up. How does that make you feel? Very proud. And Good. I was really happy. You know, it was when I finished this book last year, January, that we discovered that he was quoted 53.7 thousand times per hour per day in social media. And what it was saying is that, you know, here we are in a pandemic. Right. And we didn't even know what that was, right? <laughs> but we were questioning our mortality. Who was next, right? Isolating ourselves. Um, and while doing so, we were forced to watch this horrific killing of George Floyd. And even in spite of it being a pandemic, in spite of us questioning our mortality, right? That young people, organized mass movements in 18 um, countries abroad, in 50 states right here, where people of the human family were proclaiming Black Lives Matter too, right? Because now they got it. They understood what we've been talking about. Right. They understood what slavery, the psychological traumas, the, the trafficking of, of African bodies, of, of indigenous people's bodies. And so they got it, they understood. And I think that they then were able to see that this was Malcolm's re reaction hmm. to the horrors and atrocities that were happening. And they understood that he was um, strategic, right? That he was organizing, that he traveled abroad, not, you know, without, assistance without security, but that he was looking for solutions. And, and, and um, so I think that this generation, you know, are attra were attracted to Malcolm and, and they wanted to employ his strategies. Um, and we know that Malcolm spoke truth, of course, and truth Absolutely. is timeless. Yes. And, and I'm, you know, so I'm so grateful. And understanding he was only in his 20s I know. You know, people are always like, oh, my God, your father changed when he came back from the Middle East. No, he was in his 20s when the world learned of him. He was 39 when he was assassinated, but still mm -hmm. such a young man to have made an enormous impact. Enormous. Enormous impact. I want to talk about George Floyd. Why? You know, I. As I see all of these companies doing, you know, Black Lives Matter social media posts and everybody, you know, DEI efforts, sometimes I feel it's really performative. And I want to ask you, because I feel this way, what what do you think it was about George Floyd? And and you know, I think the universe unfortunately used him to to open people's eyes, you know, because he wasn't the first, right? We can go all the way back to your father and Martin Luther King, and we can, you know, we Fred Hampton, we can go to, you know, Eleanor Bumpers. I remember that when I was in New York, Amadou Diallo, there's so many, Trayvon Martin. Why was it, even Rodney King, like we all saw that on television. What was it, do you think, about the murder of George Floyd that made people not just black and brown people, but people all over the world say this enough of this. Like, what do you think it is? Because I really want, I'm really careful when I'm in, you know, mixed audiences. I'm on a lot of boards and I and they always bring up George Floyd and we're gonna do this. And I always correct them and say, it was horrible that this man was murdered, but he wasn't the first one. Like, let's not pretend that George Floyd was the start of police brutality. And let's not forget about all the other countless black and brown men that have been murdered by the police, but why do you think it was George Floyd that made people's eyes open up? What's your opinion on that? Well, I, I think it was the pandemic. You think so? We were all home. I think not just that we're home, but that we're questioning our mortality. Oh, we didn't know if we were gonna live or die. 
And so yeah, that's true. we became a human family. Mm. And, and even in spite of, you know, we're wearing masks. We've never worn masks before. Right. We can't go near our, our loved ones. Right. It was serious. Yeah. Right? yeah. And we were forced to quarantine ourselves, <laughs> lock ourselves up. And if you got it, you had to quarantine yourself from your family if you're right. living with them. Right. So I think, you know, questioning our mortality. And now you see a police officer suffocating the life out of a, a young man, mm-hmm. he wasn't, he didn't do anything. No, he, didn't he didn't pose a threat. And so I think all of these things coupled, right? That we're questioning our mortality as individuals. Mm-hmm. We're questioning our mortality as a human family, mm-hmm. right? And and then we see this, this man, you know, and, and who's paid, by us to protect and serve us, suffocating the life out of someone so sadistically with the other officers also, one kneeling on his lung, mm. on his back. I mean, who does that? No, that no was, I didn't watch the video. Was, I can't, I don't watch. Um, that was like, wicked. That was so uh, wicked. Yeah, I can't you do know? that. Right. I, I can't do that either. But can't you can read about it, you know, mm. to understand what they did. You know, and that, and right, you know, look at Emmett Till, look at Eric Gardner, look at, you know, Ahmed Aubrey and Brent, just the list of going on. Right. Right. But I think that because we were questioning, you know, our own mortality and, and, and we all, I mean, we don't know if we're going to live or die. So you have to look at life. Pandemic. (laughs) We're still in it. Although the world wants to think it's over. (laughs) I don't, but I've never heard it phrase like that. And I, I agree with you. I think we all were subconsciously, you know, thinking about our own mortality. That's why mental illness definitely spiked in 2020. Cause it was just to your point, you got to go in your house and shut the door. You can't see anybody. You got to put this thing on your face. It was a lot to take in. And honestly, I don't even think as a country, we've even processed what happened in 2020 yet. And 2021 was such a such a blur. And now we're in 22. I don't know. I think there'll be a lot of PTSD with COVID because we haven't had a chance to breathe and just sit back and say, wait, we're in a pandemic and this man got murdered on TV. Like what's going on here? What? And it's just, it was a lot. It definitely was a lot. It was a lot, but look what our young people did. Exactly. They did. Yes. They organized this like mass movement. They sure did. They sure did. They're going to save children. Us. Yes, right. absolutely. They're going to save us all. So tell us about the Shabazz Center for those who are going to be watching who don't know what that is or where it is. Tell us, tell us about it. So the Shabazz Center, it's the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Education Center. And, you know, it's a place where my father was assassinated in on February 21st, 1965. Right. Mm. And it's also the last place that I spent with my mother on Mother's Day oh. um, before she passed away. And mm-hmm. I'm so grateful that she told me, you know, the things that were important to her and how she was so excited about finally being able to appropriate her husband's legacy, right? Oh. Because she had safeguarded it for so long. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, we turned this place of uh, tragedy into a place of triumph. And um, people can come and learn about Malcolm as well as other um, humanitarians, other freedom fighters, um, other educators. And um, we support many kinds of social movements. Um, We have lots of intergenerational dialogue. Nice. um, Right. And we have just like a dynamic team, a great board um, that we recently um, uh, you know, we, we got a new board about maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. And this dynamic young lady who's the director of institutional advancement from Harvard Divinity School, young sister, nice. you know, and we just love it. Congratulations. That's amazing. I love yeah. that. Thank so what's you. next for you? What are you working on besides writing books and speaking <laughs> and running a center? What else, what else is, what else you got going on? Um, well, I'm going to be doing some multimedia. I'm so excited. We're um, turning uh, two of my books into 
a television series. Oh with, my God, that's amazing. Yeah, Congratulations. George, yeah, yeah. I'm so excited about that with George Tillman. You remember? Yeah, I love George. I hope right. we show that on the vineyard. Hello, I want that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Ah, absolutely. What phase are you in with that? The beginning. <laughs> the beginning phase. Wow. Congratulations. That's beautiful. That's George is a good guy. We really like George. Full of my husband and him are friends. What a nice man he is. Yes, absolutely. So are you Sometimes serving as the EP on that or what do you? What absolutely. You, fantastic. Fantastic. Will it be ready next next year? Um, 23. 2023. I hope by 2023. Oh gosh. Well, we, I'm already claiming it. We're getting that from Martha's Vineyard because we want to definitely show that work. Oh, congratulations on that. Good for you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's going to be very exciting and much more realistic. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay, good. Very good. Well, I, yay. Congrats on that. Well, I want to thank you for your time. It is such an honor and a pleasure to, to speak with you and to share your story about your, your father and your mother. And I know you hear this all the time, but that book changed my life, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Like it just, it changed my life. And your father and your mother are definitely, you know, one of my heroes. Absolutely. And when my our son Zaire, I, when he turned like 15 or whatever, we made him read the book and we made our daughter Zoe read the book. And I just think it's it's such an important piece of our history that uh, that all children need to read. So I salute you and your family and wish you all the best with everything. And I hope to see you on the vineyard this August. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you.